All right. So there's lots of videos out there that will show you methods for pulling the shoulder back into place and you can, you can find those a lot of places. We're gonna go over what the actual changes in the anatomy are when you do those different moves with the shoulder and why they theoretically work to get the shoulder back into place. I hope this will paint a picture of the physics that are involved in relocating dislocated shoulders. Okay, so here are a couple of highlights from shoulder night. So here is our shoulder. Um, this is actually our scapula. You can see there's the glenoid. Uh, there's the chromium coming over from the top, scapula coming down. Um, and this, our drumstick ice cream, is actually going to be our humerus. So if we, um, and something important about the, the humerus here is the top of the ice cream cone itself inside is actually the humerus. The outside is the joint capsule. Um, and this is something that's gonna be important when we talk about reductions and why they work. So if we put the uh, humerus on to the glenoid there um, and somebody dislocates, they tend to dislocate in a couple of ways. One is the most common when they go anterior is to come sub uh, coracoid. So that is straight from the side here um, and basically directly medial, so it's right under the uh, coracoid there. The other way that you can dislocate is to come subglenoid. So instead of coming straight across, you come down and in. So um, comes here and comes down and in. So that's subglenoid. Uh, so we'll talk about a couple things why that's important. So if uh, there was a guy named Coker, there's a Coker method developed about how you reduce the shoulder. And basically this is what he said. He said that uh, when he looked at cadavers and they had dislocated shoulders, he was trying to figure out what was going on that was keeping them from being reduced. So when he was looking at it and a shoulder was in this sub, uh, let me see there, sub glenoid region, um, the, what he found was that what was keeping the shoulder from going back in place was not actually the musculature, which is really tight, but it's this capsule that's right there. So as you can see, as you rotate it, I'll try to make it so you can see there, when you ro internally rotate it, that, in that capsule gets really tight on the glenoid. So what he said was, in order to loosen that capsule so we can even access the glenoid, we're gonna start by externally rotating, and as I externally rotate, hopefully you can see that package starting to loosen up there, and that's gonna give the shoulder a chance to actually come back in the socket. And then what he did was he brought the arm into extension, and when he brought it into extension, it loosens up that wrapping even more right there, and then when he internally rotates it at that point, the internal rotation has a chance to bring the shoulder back into socket. Um, so this is very similar to the Hennepin method um, where they externally rotate, they actually uh, abduct the shoulder and then internally rotate. But we get the same, we get the same effect where we take, the, take a really tight capsule, by externally rotating it, we loosen it up, um, we bring it up um, away from the body, either with extension or abduction, which loosens that capsule even more. And then when we internally rotate it, it gives the joint a chance to come right back on top. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about scapular manipulation too. Um, so, uh, everybody talks about scapular manipulation and the question is why and where does it work? So I, I think we'll, we'll demonstrate it on the little guy here in a second to really show how much the scapula moves and how it changes the articulation. But let's just talk about it in regards to a uh, subglenoid dislocation. So if we're not subcoracoid here, we're subglenoid, we're, we're a little bit down and in. And I'm gonna take my, uh, I'm gonna take it out of the wrapping paper here. So we've come down and in. So um, when you have this kind of dislocation, you can get muscle contraction that's actually going to rotate the uh, scapula out. And remember, the scapula is only attached um, through many ligaments to the rest of the skeleton um, at the sternum, and so it has a lot of free play here. So you can see in this type of dislocation, we might just be a little bit of manipulation of the scapula away from actually opening up the glenoid um, to the uh, 
humeral head coming right back in. As you can see, here we are. We'll bring it a little farther away from the camera. So uh, we're in a regular alignment here. We get in uh, anterior and a little bit inferior dislocation, which is our subglenoid dislocation. We get a lot of strain on the, uh, on the scapula from muscle spasm. It rotates and then we're right back into that space where they're not quite in line. If we bring that tip of the scapula back just a little bit, we can open up that glenoid so it falls right back into place. So my thoughts on this are, I'm not sure this is described anywhere, but if you look at an x-ray and you have a subglenoid um, dislocation, scapular manipulation is probably probably the best thing to go to right away. If it's subcoracoid here, um, even with that, you might need to do a couple other manipulations because just by bringing it, you might not get, we'll bring it in front, you might not get that angle uh, you might not get that angle in place. You might need to pull it a little to the side and loosen that joint capsule like we talked be, before. So this is one reason by, why looking at your x-ray and getting an x-ray might be a really good idea so it can help uh, give you an idea of um, where that uh, dislocation is and it can help tailor what you're going to do to try to treat it. All right, we'll bring this little dude back up into view. So the uh, the other question is, do you need to, I'm gonna have him talk like a puppet here, do you need to actually get an x-ray? So the uh, recommendations um, uh, are that if there's trauma involved in it, um, you should get an x-ray because there can be associated fractures um, and uh, you wanna make sure that you know what those are before you reduce. So you can see if those fractures occurred um, uh, uh, before the reduction if you need any other treatment of those. Um, but if it's somebody who's reduced a lot of times and there's a low mechanism, like they rolled over in bed, uh, then at that point they do not necessarily need an x-ray uh, before the reduction takes place. And here is our final little ice cream cone de demonstration. So uh, I think a lot of people now are going to um, injections into the joint capsule before uh, before reduction. And we'll talk a little bit about the method for that. So um, usually to get into the joint, you're not able to come from, let's see if I can do this with one hand, you're not able to come directly from the lateral aspect because you're gonna hit the humerus before you get into the joint capsule. So uh, most of those injections with the joint in place actually come from behind the shoulder and you can get in um, to the joint capsule from um, from from behind, um, and that is a good ultrasound way, guided way to do it. But in this case, with the humerus is displaced, it actually opens up the joint, so um, it is readily available from the lateral aspect. Uh, the studies that that have been done on this show uh, a couple things. So the first is that you want to come about, uh, you want to go into the metacromial line. You want to come, uh, which is right there, you want to come two centimeters down. So uh, I suggest that you measure your fingers and you know how big your fingers are. Mine happens to be two centimeters. So two centimeters below the acromion in the midline is where you want to go for your injection. It needs to be a sterile process that's done. Um, and the studies that have, been, that have been shown, they initially looked at using 20 cc's of 1% uh, lidocaine during it. I, I don't think that I've seen many people use a full 20 cc's. Um, and there's other studies that have looked at using uh, uh, opiates in there and might, there's probably some mu receptors within the shoulder that you can target and that combination of analgesia actually within the shoulder has given great results. So there's a Cochrane meta-analysis, meta uh, Cochrane database meta-analysis that came out and they said that the, uh, that the, re the success of reduction with IV analgesia um, was about, uh, was as equal to interarticular in injections. Um, people had uh, better pain control uh, with IV analgesia. Um, they were able to get the shoulder in at the same rate with, with both techniques, um, and that there were shorter ED stays if uh, with uh, inter interarticular injection by a pretty significant amount, probably about three quarters of an hour. Um, there have been a couple studies lately that kind of call that into question. One of the studies used actually Demerol and Versed as the agents, the IV agents, and I don't think um, compared that to IV um, uh, interarticular injections. Um, and that study showed that the Demerol worked better. I don't think any of us actually use Demerol in the department or, or particularly have access to it to be able to, to do that. 
Um, and the second one only had a 40% success rate with the interarticular injections. Um, and that's compared to like 80 or 90% in the other studies. So um, I'm not sure uh, what their methodology was on that that had such a big, big difference. Um, so interarticular injections are something that we use and that is the, uh, the way that we can go about doing them. So we're gonna talk about two more things that I've been ruminating about, about the uh, shoulder injections in particular. Uh, the first is that there's been some studies that have shown that if you use uh, Marcane on kids' shoulders, you can maybe hurt the growth of uh, the cartilage in that shoulder. So we shouldn't be using that. Um, and there's some question about lidocaine, maybe if it might have some toxicity. Um, on one of the papers that came out in pediatrics about this, um, there was some commentary uh, published in the next issue kind of calling into question whether um, that was fully safe or not. So I think that's gonna be, it's gonna take some time to figure that out. Um, so here's another thing that I've been thinking about with the injection into the shoulder. So if you have um, a shoulder that's dislocated and we're talking about putting 20 cc's in um, and we're also talking about trying to disengage that capsule, we're just going to talk about what would happen and you know what this is all theoretical but what would happen if you are to actually put a lot of fluid into that joint capsule. So if we have our uh, joint capsule here and then we're gonna put fluid into it, which is basically the same as putting air into this. You can see how that brings that capsule up and puts a lot more space into it. That actually might give you some mechanical advantage of taking that off the glenoid, of removing the pressure on the uh, glenoid actually, just by having some volume in, um, volume in the shoulder. Now, I don't think there's studies or anything about it, but it kind of makes sense when you, when you think about that 20 cc's they're putting in, that maybe that actually might give you some mechanical advantage as well. So we've talked a little bit about the process of loosening the joint capsule actually to get the um, to get a, uh, the shoulder back into place, and that's one of the reasons that most of the methods actually use some form of ex form of external rotation to loosen the joint capsule around the glenoid. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing that we can um, that we do is I tend to notice that I get reduction just past 90 degrees um, when we're when we're just past 90 degrees, probably about 120 degrees. So the reason that that is, that this is actually called the zero point. There's a great uh, web uh, site called shoulderdislocation.net. They talk about this zero point. And when you're up here, this is actually where you have the least tension on all the muscle groups. So you kind of equalize um, and mitigate most of the forces on the muscles. Um, this is where the, even if they are spasming, the effect of that spasm is gonna be less. So any technique where you're moving um, from uh, a shoulder that is uh, abducted um, and either adducting it um, or uh, bringing it up in extension, both of those are bringing it up until there's less muscle tension. And that's why we tend to get this place here where the shoulder goes um, uh, from dislocated to reduced. And that's because we, we reduce the muscle tension at those places.